Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, uh, let's, let's go, shall we? I just ran up the stairs, okay? That's why I'm out of breath. I'm not out of shape. The original link to the video, top of the description, Discord below that. Let's go, let's learn. If you talk to someone about the Vulcan today, they'll often associate its history with that of its use in the Falklands conflict of 1982, when it undertook the longest bombing raid of any RAF aircraft flying from Ascension Island. The Vulcan, however, wasn't designed for that particular role. It was designed in the early stages of the Cold War as a nuclear high-level bomber. How are you guys? Good, I hope. In Britain, following the end of the Second World War, thoughts turned to future conflict, and a decision was made to tender the aircraft companies of the day to produce a bomber that would be able to fly fairly long range and to drop a nuclear weapon. What's particularly interesting is that that decision was made before the decision was made to proceed with Britain's independent nuclear weapon. The Vulcan was one of a number of designs. Initially, six aircraft companies tendered for the idea, four of which went forward to prototype stage. The first one is one that's not particularly well known, the short Sperrin, a fairly conventional looking aeroplane, albeit four engines with a pair mounted above each other in each wing. Two were made, but it didn't go into production. The first production bomber that came from that was the Vickers Valiant. Again, a fairly conventional aircraft, and unfortunately, it didn't progress very far due to a change in tactics and fatigue life. The next aircraft to fly was the Vulcan, the second to carry the V name. By this point, the Air Ministry had decided that their previous idea of naming bombers after famous towns and cities in the UK needed a little bit of a change as the aircraft became more dynamic. So the Vulcan became the second of the V bomber. It was followed into service by the Handley Really interesting intake thing thingamajiggins here. So the Vulcan became the second of the V-bomber. It was followed into service by the Handley Page Victor. Able to actually carry slightly more bombs than the Vulcan, it never went on to gain the same fame. So, we're now in the pilot seat of our Avro Vulcan. It's a very cramped uh, area to be in, <laughs> but probably for the pilot and the co-pilot on my right, they have at least got a fairly decent view outside, at least they can see outside, unlike the three crew members sitting behind. In this position, we'll notice quite a few interesting features of the, of the Vulcan, one of which is the control column in front. Unlike most bombers, it's not of the spectacle handle type, but this is very much a fighter pilot style joystick. Partly because of the handling of the aircraft and the uh, modern technology that had gone into it, but it certainly gave the pilot and co-pilot when they were sitting in here a very different feel to most of the other bombers of the era. In the centre, we have four uh, throttles, one, one each for each engine, and that's represented by um, quadruple instruments in front of us for engine pressures, oil pressures and otherwise. The Vulcan itself was a... Okay, so... So... All of these uh, uh, measuring things here are are all the same thing just for each engine, right? So one engine, two engine, three engine, four engine, and then one, two, three, four. As for engine pressures, oil pressures, and otherwise. The Vulcan itself was able to be started in a conventional way with individual engines running, but in the event of a scramble, they could actually fast start, which would involve firing all four engines simultaneously, and that would allow uh, a squadron to get into the air in less than four minutes. A proportion of the crews that fly the V-bombers is always on hand. itself from the Avro Aircraft Company is an aircraft not too dissimilar in some respects to the aircraft that preceded it, the 
Rolls-Royce Merlin engined Avro Lancaster. I imagine a Lancaster pilot sitting in the cockpit of the Vulcan, other than having to deal with a number of extra features caused by having jet engines, probably would have noticed something very similar in the instrument panel here. When this aircraft what an, a beautiful other... airplane, guys. Uh, what is it? The Spitfire looking... Uh... Than having to deal with a number of extra features caused by having jet oh, beautiful. engines. Probably would have noticed something... I, I probably sound really stupid there, okay? I, I'm still learning, but these just look like the front ends of... Is it the Spitfire or the... You know, and so it just looks like you you strip this the cockpit of a Spitfire and then just made two of them and then slapped a a giant fuselage in the middle. Right, a number of extra features I, caused okay. by having jet engines probably would have noticed something very similar in the instrument panel. I've here. said that before. When this aircraft, I have to shut up. Jesus Christ! Thing to deal with a number of extra features caused by having jet engines probably would have noticed something very similar in the instrument panel here. When this aircraft first flew in the 1950s, it really wasn't that far ahead in terms of what we're looking at from the Lancaster. Indeed, through to the end of its service by the mid-80s, things hadn't changed at all either. The system still worked, the dials still did what they needed to, and they didn't really modernise it. So someone who flew a Vulcan at the early part of its service would have noticed very few changes by the end of its service life. One thing with the Vulcan was that it was a very electrical aircraft. It didn't have a lot of systems in it that were unnecessary, and the electric function meant that if the electrical power to the aircraft was lost, things like control on the control column would become very difficult, if not impossible. As a result, just up in front of us on the instrument panel is a release for the Ram Air Turbine. Underneath the wing is a small airflow generator that will drop, and that will provide enough power for the pilot to gain control of the aircraft in the event of electrical system failure. The Vulcan control column will allow the aircraft to move to control the elevons on the rear surface of the wing, but because of the forces required to move it, they are inputted electronically, and a real feel had to be put in to stop pilots overstressing the aircraft. What, what do you mean? Electronically. Of the forces required to move it, they are inputted electronically. As opposed to manually? I, I thought he was going to say, like, hydraulically or... Real feel had to be put in to... Okay, sorry. Yeah, okay. So it just, you, you couldn't manually, like, one-to-one -one pull a lever and, and it... Okay, I, I get it, I get it. Stop pilots overstressing the aircraft. What were your initial impressions of the whole thing, then? Oh, very impressed, yes, with the power and the... Uh and the performance of it, the way it handled. It wasn't heavy, I mean, it was very light on the control because the feel was artificial, in fact. There was no real feel of the aircraft. That had to be fed in to give the pilot the feeling that he was flying the airplane when it was electric. It wasn't supersonic, but it was very close to that, and I suppose the swept wing of the Delta made it possible to uh, achieve these speeds. The Vulcan. So, so does he mean the the gentleman talking? Um, that because there were certain electric components that it didn't feel like other aircraft, where you felt like you had a feel for every aspect of of the aircraft. You know, you 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 pull this and it. it so it, it's like it's like an automatic versus a manual. Is that what he means? Supersonic, but it was very close to that, and I suppose the swept wing of the Delta made it possible to uh, achieve these speeds. 
The Vulcan has a crew of five. Up front, both the pilot and co-pilot are sitting on ejector seats underneath a jettisonable canopy. In the event of an emergency, it's often the case that the co-pilot would have ejected. That would have allowed the canopy to depart. The co-pilot would have followed, but it would have allowed the aircraft itself to depressurize. Very important because the three guys in the back, all facing backwards, the air electronics officer, because the three guys in the back, all facing backwards, the air electronics officer, the navigator plotter and the navigator radar, weren't equipped with ejection seats. They would have had to open the crew access door, rotate Jump. their seats and physically move out of those seats, aided by an inflating bag in the chair. I burped, sorry. Seats, Excuse me, gross. physically move out of those seats, aided by an inflating bag in the chair, to push them towards the door and hopeful to safety. Conditions in the cockpit of the Vulcan are very cramped. In terms of crew comforts, they didn't have a huge amount. They were equipped with a pair of food heaters, one of which is behind the pilot seat, the other behind the co-pilot seat, neither of which were to be relied upon for actually warming up the can of soup that you may have put in there. The original What's Vulcan the design catered for just one pilot, but um, Avro is asked to standardize by fitting two ejection seats side by side in the extremely small cockpit compared with the Valiant and the Victor, which had a very tightly curved roof. And that is why many of us who flew the Vulcan for, for many, many years have a virtual permanent crick in the neck. The head was either that way to the left or that way to the right to, uh, to cater for the combing. Flight time in the Vulcan, the crew in here could have been inside for eight or more hours. In the case of the Falklands mission, that was possibly doubled to around 16 hours or so. The Vulcan was designed to carry conventional bombs, but also nuclear weapons in the event of the Cold War becoming hot. The Vulcan has four engines buried deep within the wing root of that massive Delta wing. When the Vulcan was designed, the Delta was a new concept. So new, in fact, that Avro actually built a number of one-third scale prototypes, we could call them, to test out the theory of the Delta wing. It was certainly the first production aircraft in the RAF to adopt this shape, and really the first combat aircraft anywhere in the world to do so. During the later stages of the Second World War, the Germans had experimented with the Delta shape, but it was still a very new concept. It was the Vulcan's Delta wing as well that enabled it to have longevity of service life. Preceding it into service was the Valiant, but when the V-Force was requested to fly at low level, the wings on the Valiant began to show signs of stress and they were withdrawn from service. But the Vulcan's big thick wing protected it when it reverted to that low level role. But originally it was designed to go in at high level, to drop nuclear weapons on Russian towns and cities in the event of that becoming a necessity. They would have been painted overall bright white, anti-flash white, but when they reverted to the low level role, by which point they would probably have been carrying more tactical nuclear weapons in the case of something like the blue steel standoff weapon, boy. they gained this camouflage surface to protect what kind them of weapon? in the blue steel standoff weapon. They gained this camouflage surface to protect them in that environment. With the switch to low level, a dark green camouflage paint was introduced but oh my god they gained this camouflage surface to protect them in that environment with the switch to low level a dark green camouflage paint was introduced but of course the boffins had quite failed to appreciate that to a fighter loitering above we now stood out like the proverbial sore thumb nor at low level could we use the, the blackout curtains. But of course, that against flash, or? Against nuclear flash, that's absolutely right. So, so we couldn't use these at low level. We needed to look out to make sure we weren't going to fly into anything. And so we were issued with and were required to wear on operations a standard black medical eye patch. And in the event of being blinded, we were to lift it up, switch it over and put it on the other eye. Not Makes very scientific, sense. was it? And certainly not very comforting. But that was the primary aid to protect against nuclear flash at that time. And so they Guys, unrelated, but... Is it true that pirates wore patches so that they, when they went underneath the deck, 
where it's really dark, they could flip the eye patch off of the eye that's now very used to darkness and it can see better. Is that true or is that a fiction? They slide past the giants of the US Strategic Air Command. Following them, the huge white shapes of Britain's long range heavies. Their vast bulks making their speed appear deceptively slow. That wing alone, that Mark II wing, uh, surface that area. Put 2,000 feet on the cruise climb ceiling, even without the bigger, more powerful Olympus engines that were fitted to the Mark II. So that, you know, with four times 20,000 pounds of thrust, and for demonstration purposes, you could get the weight down to about 100, 110,000 pounds. The thrust weight ratio was absolutely astronomical. The highest I ever had of Vulcan was 62,500 feet. Uh, not much fuel left, I must admit. Critical mark number, well, of course, in those days, one was never absolutely certain of position errors. But I dare say the high fastest we ever went was in the region of 9.6 or 9.7. Uh, Vulcan, X I really would like to learn more about the, the purposes and intention, or the, the reasons behind choosing certain shapes of aircraft wings. Um, from the, is it the B, B, B something stealth bomber, the cool looking black one that almost looks like a Batman, but uh, with, with like the, the, ch -ch -ch the, okay, I'm not explaining well, but I, I, I would just love to hear the reasons in more in-depth detail of, of why they choose the, the, the wing shape that they do on certain planes. Trey Juliet 824 is a Vulcan B2. It's the second variant of the Vulcan, the second main production variant. And this particular one was used all of its life as a bomber. It flew with numerous squadrons all over the country and indeed around the world, and was delivered to Duxford in March 1982. Very significantly, it was delivered by a pilot by the name of Martin Withers, who just a few weeks or months later, when the Falklands conflict began, he undertakes the first of the Black Buck raids, flying a Vulcan from Ascension Island to the Falklands, where he drops bombs that crater the main runway. This particular mission was the longest bombing raid undertaken by the RAF, and indeed by any country up to that point. And so, very expensively, and with a great deal of effort, we were able to mount some six... Sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt him. I'm going to go back. I, I did interrupt, but... And indeed, by any... But is Ascension Island near that island that Napoleon was... that he died on? It... Country up to that point. And so, very expensively, and with a great deal of effort, we were able to mount some six attacks on the Falkland Islands by Vulcans operating out of Ascension. I say very expensively because in order to get one Vulcan over the Falkland Islands, we needed 17 tankers. They had to actually refurbish the flight in-flight refueling system to the Vulcan. There was a shortage of probes, and the director of the Imperial War Museum was telling me that the RAF even borrowed a probe off a Vulcan bomber which they had in the museum. I'm told that they did return it after the war. They were extremely long and extremely difficult sorties for the crews involved. Uh, flight refueling is not perhaps as quite as easy as it looks. The Vulcan speed and the and the tanker speed have to be coordinated. They have a very small basket to aim. I don't think it looks probe. easy. And of course, only a small window in which they could do this refueling. The Avro Vulcan is a truly amazing aircraft. It has a real affinity with the British public and being able to see one here at Duxford allows you to look at its immense size, its immense presence that it must have had in the sky and to compare it to an aircraft that flew just 11 years before it in the shape of the piston engine Avro Lancaster. The Vulcan is it a of the three V-bombers has gone down probably as the most famous, partly because of its role in the Falklands campaign, partly also because after that conflict, it was retired as a bomber within the same year, by December 1982. But the legacy of the Vulcan was such that the RAF themselves kept one airframe on as a display aircraft for a number of years, allowing the public to continue seeing this aircraft long after it had gone out of service.
Very great video. Uh, I just, I wonder if he said it and I didn't catch it, then my bad. But is there a magnetic, are, are these magnetic things? So at least if you get it in the cone, it can, and I'm assuming, you know, it's got to be a pretty tight fit for the fuel to go down and not just spray out of here and in, into the the windshield of the uh, the cockpit of the plane trying to be refueled. And so I'm assuming there's a magnetic connection or something like that. A uh, really great video. Sorry if I paused too much there. Um, yeah, I love Imperial War Museums. Love learning about these planes and any uh, military vehicles, to be honest. Really fun. You guys are awesome in the comments. Thanks, thank you for uh, answering my questions. I hope you can do the same for this video or just any comments in general. I'd really appreciate. I'll see you guys next time. Bye, guys.